And I'm happy to welcome you to this SRSG event featuring Jose Ramos Horta, the Special Representative of the Secretary General and Head of the United Nations Integrated Peacebuilding Office in Guinea-Bissau, which has one of the most inelegant acronyms of any at the UN, uh, called UNIAGBIS. Is that? I hope that's the last time I have to say that. Um, I often say uh, that of all the public events we do here at IPI, this series is one of my favorite activities because it appeals to me as a longtime foreign correspondent because it brings to this UN headquarters audience the people who are representing the UN in the field and often in the most remote, neglected, and conflicted parts of that field. So I consider these SRSG reports dispatches from the front. And I will make that comment in particular with our guest today because he actually began life as a journalist, writing and broadcasting in his own country, Timor-Leste. I am happy to claim him as an old acquaintance because in the 1980s, we spent some time together in Brazil where I was based as the New York Times Rio de Janeiro bureau chief and he was traveling the world building up support for the Revolutionary Front for the Independence of Timor-Leste. Uh, I mentioned this to Jose beforehand that I would be mentioning that and he said we've actually seen each other more recently and I said yes when he said when the Brazilian actress Sonia Braga was in New York and um, and he said you monopolized all the time with her and I could not get a word in. <laughs> of course unlike some of us Jose outgrew journalism going on to become foreign minister, prime minister, and president of Timor-Leste, and winning the Nobel Peace Prize in 1996 for his work bringing a just and peaceful resolution to the conflict there. I should add that during his presidency in 2008, he was wounded in a brazen but happily unsuccessful assassination attempt by rebel soldiers. So that amounts to a bountiful wealth of experience for the man whom Secretary General Ban Ki-moon named to the SRSG post in Guinea-Bissau in January of this year. And he will need to call upon all of it, given the problems being confronted by Guinea-Bissau. While the country is rich in natural resources, including minerals and cashews and some of the world's best fisheries, Political instability has hindered investment and kept most of its 1.6 million people mired in poverty. A former Portuguese colony, Guinea-Bissau has become a hub for international drug traffickers who bring in cocaine produced in Latin America before shipping it on either to Europe or the US. Weak institutions, along with a coastline studded with deep inlets and inconspicuous airfields throughout its 88 archipelago islands, make it an ideal base for smugglers. The country is one of the poorest countries in the world, ranking 176 out of the 187 countries on the United Nations Human Development Index. The military has dominated politics in the country ever since it fought its way to independence from Portugal in 1974. And in April a year ago, rogue officers seized power in a military coup d'etat. The leader of the coup, Armed Forces Chief General Antonio Indaji, was charged last month by U.S. authorities with plotting to traffic cocaine to the United States and sell weapons, including surface-to-air weapons, to the FARC rebels in Colombia. Guinea-Bissau is now being run by a so-called transitional government, but Mr. Ramos Horta, in briefing the Security Council yesterday, said that, quote, the state exists in name only. Just in past weeks, he's been meeting with a wide range of people in and outside of Bissau with the purpose of creating a roadmap that will lead to holding elections by the end of the year and preparing the country for post-electoral consolidation. But just the holding of elections will not be enough. And this was pointed out yesterday on the council by the permanent representative of Brazil, Maria Luisa Ribeiro Viotti, who is also the chair of the Guinea-Bissau configuration of the UN Peacebuilding Commission. She warned against what she called the, quote, winner-take-all dynamics of Guinea-Bissau politics. 
And then you have scarcities of food, water, electricity, public health facilities, and a strike this week that has closed all the schools in the country and threatens to continue on for another month. The mandate, I have to say it again, of, of Uniobig <laughs> expires this month. And the Security Council has just agreed at the recommendation of the Secretary General to extend it for another year. Now, challenges of this size require a big leader. And I submit that there is no bigger one, no one better suited to the task than Nobel Peace Prize winner and former president and prime minister, Jose Ramos Horta. Jose, my old friend, I am delighted to welcome you to IPI. It's a great uh, pleasure, uh, privilege to be here in this building. I'm terrified to go to the 11th floor because uh, over the years, from 75, 76, till in the late 80s, I would come to the 11th floor to the United Methodist Office of the UN, Women's Division, under the leadership of Mia Ajali, and would make thousands of photocopies over the year, never paid. And uh, so i always afraid that she will one day show me the bill. Uh, so, I, I knew about that, but I left that out of the introduction. So <laughs> very familiar with this building. A lot of uh, conspiracies for good, for justice, uh, happen in these many floors of this building. Uh, <clears throat> A few uh, weeks ago, when I was appointed to uh, this uh, responsibility in Guinea-Bissau, a little friend of mine, uh, now five years old, uh, she texted me because uh, she always asked me, uh, when I asked her, what do you want uh, uh, as present? One day she came with this unusual request. She wanted a real pink unicorn. And I told her mother, where am I going to get a real pink unicorn? Then when I was appointed to the job, she mis, uh, misheard and she said, Jose, uh, now you're the head of unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very difficult to explain to her about to Guinea-Bissau, about the United Nations, and obviously. Uh, you have a valid point in saying the name is a bit complicated. Even myself, in the beginning, I had difficulties pronouncing. So to spare myself from embarrassing in front of my own staff, I always call the mission. <laughs> uh, having said that, uh, there are uh, other, uh, there were other possibility of uh, jobs for me when I left office in May. One of our favorite uh, jobs of every retiring ambassador, as they are heading towards retirement, their last post, or any uh, former head of state, is the ambassadorial post to the Vatican. And I talk seriously to the prime minister, the president, and the foreign minister about going to Rome, to the Vatican. I even had a work plan that I would go to the office only every Tuesdays in the morning. I leave by Thursday afternoon, and the rest I go off traveling in Italy. The, for, the foreign minister was very re, has very relaxed attitude. He agreed, but he asked me whether there was precedence for former head of state becoming ambassadors. I was read, I gave him a long list. Walter Mondale, vice president, ambassador to Tokyo. Former President of Brazil, Itamar Franco, Ambassador in Washington and later in Rome, Ambassador in Lisbon. Lourdes Pintasilgo, Portuguese Prime Minister, Ambassador to UNESCO. So I went. So he was convinced that there was there a person. But the Prime Minister Shanana Guzman didn't take it seriously. President Taumata Ruak didn't take it seriously. So when Ban Ki moon, Secretary General, came to Timor last in August. They all talked to him about Guinea-Bissau, about me, etc. Then in October, I was approached about to uh, 
whether I would consider going to Guinea-Bissau. Although by then I was already engaged with a new organization called Asian Peace and Reconciliation Council, headquarters in Bangkok, uh, comprising former heads of states, prime minister, foreign ministers of uh, all of Asia, some of the most experienced uh, elder statesmen or not so elder statesmen from Asia are there, like former vice president of Indonesia, Yusuf Kala, former foreign minister of Indonesia, Hassan Urejuda, former prime minister of Malaysia, Badawi, former deputy prime minister of Singapore, Professor Jayakumar, top international law professor. And throughout Asia, we had people from Pakistan, China, Japan, and so on. Two topics on the agenda of the Asian Peace and Reconciliation Council, the South China Sea dispute, a mission was in Beijing recently for some uh, initial brainstorming. Another mission will be going to the Philippines soon. And uh, the next topic was, uh, the other topic is Afghanistan. That was my own proposal to the group when I said in our founding meeting in September in Bangkok, US, NATO will be withdrawing from Afghanistan. Who is going to deal with the fallout of NATO with US withdrawal from Afghanistan? You know, we cannot always expect Americans, Europeans to die in Afghanistan, and then Asian leaders don't do much about it. Then they agreed to put on the agenda. And of course, I'm no longer much involved with it because I accepted the responsibility, the privilege, the confidence of the Secretary General to go to Guinea-Bissau, a brotherly, sisterly country, similar challenges to Timor-Leste, same population, similar population, uh, fragile states. Uh, we were a much more fragile state than it is today. But Timor Leste, as many of you who are familiar, uh, is with Guinea Bissau, with Afghanistan, Nepal, Central African Republic, Liberia, many countries form the group uh, G7 plus, uh, G7 minor, not to confuse. Uh, with uh, the G7, uh, the G8 big. And that is to share experience and the group gaining more and more of visibility, effectiveness under the leadership of uh, our Minister of Finance, Emilia Pires. Uh, Guinea-Bissau is a member of, of uh, the group. Uh, the group stemmed out of the, the, the uh, Accra Declaration, Paris Declaration on alignment of uh, donors and recipient countries. Uh, and it's becoming, uh, from what it started a few years ago only, today becoming an effective tool of uh, dialogue, exchange of information, and the pressure. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, similar uh, challenge that we, uh, we face. Uh, and I was not new to Guinea-Bissau. I had been there before in 2003, 2004, when I was foreign minister of Timor-Leste. I was asked by the CPLP countries, the Portuguese-speaking community, to go to uh, Bissau. There were rumors at the time of a possible coup. And uh, my mission was to try to prevent a coup from happening. I have to say, totally unsuccessfully because <laughs> the coup did happen. But uh, when I was in Bissau, I, I understood why the coup will happen. There will be no one who could persuade the military that there will be no coup. They wouldn't tell you there's going to be a coup, but you could see in the way we talk, body language, etc., etc. And uh, the only possibility would be for the president, because the coup was aiming at the president, that uh, if you were to graciously resign, the president at the time was Kumbayala, a very charismatic, uh, colorful, interesting uh, person. If you spend time with him, as I did recently, he would uh, quote to you all the ancient Greek philosophers. and. Uh, he studied in a Jesuit school, then he studied uh, law, and then converted to Islam uh, from Catholicism because he was upset with the bishop because the bishop uh, criticized him. The next day, 
he converted to Islam. That's how he told me. And he told me, you can tell the bishop why I became a Muslim, because you are criticizing me all the time. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> familiar with uh, one, um, when we read situations from abroad, because it's always difficult, particularly through television, uh, to have a, a complete picture of a particular uh, country situation. And uh, when you hear about coup, you hear about the military taken over. And of course, the immediate reaction, and rightly so, from the international community is to impose sanctions. The African Union have come a long way from the 30s to the policies today of zero tolerance on coups. This happened with the European Union, the same with the United States and countries around the world. But the reality in Guinea-Bissau is not that the military did a coup and then they took over de facto uh, in every aspect. They dissolved the uh, parliament, uh, ban, uh, suspend constitution, and uh, dismiss all the judges, etc., etc. No. ECOWAS intervened, uh, forced the government to form a transition uh, cabinet. No military, only civilians. They uh, persuade the government, the military, not to uh, impose the dissolution of the National Assembly. The National Assembly was kept and still there. Uh, they were the ones who helped negotiations about picking a prime minister. And the prime minister, an independent individual, he used to work with the bank, in e an Equus bank, uh, Equus authority. So it's not like you have a a group of military take over, they become president, become prime minister, they become ministers. And you have so this group of civilians, some genuine people, the president is genuine, the prime minister is genuine, many others, but others probably, they would not be ministers without a coup. And they might want to prolong the transition for as long as possible because through normal elections, they will not have a, a ministerial position. But so things are not black and white, and you have to deal with the situation. And uh, the unfortunate, the, the drama of Guinea-Bissau, that it is poor, extremely poor. There is a coup, and then you have a sanctions. The government, civilian government, many of them well motivated. They are pressured by everybody, including by me, by everybody. And then many of them are criticized by their own family members. I have a met with many of the ministers uh, in private, talking as human beings, you know, people to people. I always call them brother, you know, I said, uh, I don't call them, you know, excellency here and there, you know, because we are brothers. And, uh, and some of them, he said, now, you know, my children say I'm a golpista, because golpista means cool supporter, because, you know, I said, I'm not a golpista. I didn't support the coup, I condemn it, but I, I had to accept the responsibility to trying to prevent the country from sliding further into crisis. I have to say, when I first arrived, my first responsibility, and you don't have to be an Einstein in diplomacy to realize that you have to work with all the local national actors, regardless who they are. The Secretary General didn't send me to Guinea-Bissau to talk only to angels. We have to talk to everybody from A to Z to understand, to uh, inspire people. Uh, sometimes you use soft diplomacy, uh, sometimes you use rough uh, approach, but rough approach often only when you can do it one on one, when they respect you as a brother, they know you're talking to them very rough, but as a brother who really cares about them, about the country. But also primarily ceding leadership to ECOWAS. It's not the UN that is the lead agency in this conflict. That's the instruction, the directives from the Secretary General. And uh, rightly so. The better regional organizations are organized, the more effective they are to deal with the wide range of challenges, better for each region, for the world. In so many instances in Africa, 40 years ago, the Organization of African Unity was 
totally powerless, impotent, divided to do, uh, face up a challenge in Africa. When uh, I was one of those who were pessimistic about finding ever a solution to Somalia, five years ago. You recall when the African Union decided you know, to intervene and intervene forcefully. Well, today there is a light at the end of the tunnel and thanks to African Union leadership. And uh, as some people say, you know, some African friends say, if it was a United Nations peacekeeping with American troops or European troops, few hundred dead and they are gone. Well, uh, Africans were able to sustain the casualties because they know this is our responsibility. And uh, so it was extraordinarily difficult. And uh, today there's a light at the end of the tunnel in uh, Somalia. Uh, what is extraordinary about Guinea-Bissau is that when you look at ECOWAS, you know, you, there are uh, countries and countries in ECOWAS, some with resources, some without resources, some facing their own internal challenges, but they have accepted to face with the challenge in Mali and uh, <clears throat> some internal challenge they're dealing with and uh, Guinea-Bissau. They're the ones who came in financing the government financing their own troops, ECOMIB. And uh, now they are the ones who are financing the rehabilitation of the barracks. And they are the ones who can come forward with the first monies for the pension fund for uh, retiring military people. So even before arriving there, I knew these, they will be my primary partners. Second, African Union. African Union and ECOWAS did not see eye to eye because ECOWAS was a bit more practical. African Union, rightly so, stood the ground on the issue of suspension and sanctions, zero tolerance. ECOWAS managed to reconcile these two seemingly irreconcilable uh, uh, positions in that uh, condemn the coup, but at the same time, work on the ground to try to improve the situation. So credit goes to uh, ECOWAS. But also we had to deal with CPLP, the community of Portuguese speaking countries. That is not a regional body, it's an extracontinental uh, body. And being an extracontinental body, obviously have a different perceptions of uh, problems. Brazil, in South America, uh, Portugal, European Union. And then you have five in Africa and Timor-Leste, lonely in Southeast Asia, the only CPLP country. Lonely in terms of Portuguese uh, speaking country, but uh, Timor-Leste uh, is actively uh, working with Indonesian support to join ASEAN, hopefully by next year. Timor is a member of ASEAN. But and then the European Union, uh, trying to reconcile also all of these. Uh, but we have been able to. And uh, today we can say all these uh, regional international bodies have a common vision, common stance on Guinea-Bissau. Uh, we working with the leaders in, in the country, the interim president, interim government, the military, civil society. We have now come more or less to a firm date for elections, November, December this year. In the next few days, hopefully before, before the African Union summit in Addis, there will be a more inclusive government as it has been demanded by the joint international position. If that happens, African Union very likely will lift the suspension, readmit Guinea-Bissau into the African Union. They can participate in the celebrations. So pressure is on them, the ball is on their court, Bissau Guinean authorities. They are doing their very best in extremely difficult circumstances. Bissau Guineans themselves tell me, and sometimes I find it amusing, you know, these are Bissau Guineans who tell me, that, Mr. President, don't trust Bissau Guineans. 
They, they can talk to you very nicely today in the morning, in the afternoon, they tell you something else. Well, I told them it's not really different from my own country. A politician tell you something today, by lunchtime he's having lunch with someone else, he changed his mind, and then in the afternoon someone else has talked to him, so we are used to that. And, uh, but I believe that uh, by May, uh, by uh, last week of May, there will be an inclusive government. There will be elections. But then to end my comments, of, of opportunity for uh, questions is, uh, then come the crucial uh, phase after the elections. Traditionally, we all uh, focus on elections. We pronounce the elections free, democratic, and then we all just wish the very best for the people, for the new government, and attention moves elsewhere. That has been the problem of uh, Guinea-Bissau. The country became independent in 73, 74. They had only very first few years of stability. But then uh, Nino Vieira decided to do the first coup. And once you start with a coup, it's almost like non-stop deal. So political elites, the military, they all had their share in emasculating the state. The state, already fragile, was further emasculated by the political elites and the military over the years. How could the international community, the UN, really help Guinea-Bissau? Following the elections, there should, a, with a new government, there should be what I call second phase for Guinea-Bissau, and that is the rebuilding of the institutions of the state. A smaller, modified, adapted version of what the United Nations did in Timor-Leste after 99-2000 referendum. I say smaller, adapted, because at the time Timor-Leste was a non-self-governing territory. So you had Sergio Vieira de Mello on behalf of the UN having absolute powers, legislative, executive, and the, the Security Council, uh, in the case of Timor-Leste at least, believed not a big deal in building a state. In two years, one can do that. <laughs> so told Serge de Mello, you have only two years to build a state. Once I told the Security Council, I'm so relieved they were not upset. Right in the meeting, I said, Your Excellencies, I know none of you ever ran a small Chinese takeaway shop. But do you know how long does, I just made up the story, you know. Uh, <laughs> do you know how long does it take to turn a takeaway, Chinese takeaway, you know, the plant here in Manhattan, to make it viable? I made up a figure, I said, two to three years. Actually, later, a friend of mine, American, she said, no, it takes six, seven years, because she was a more of an accountant. And, and uh, <laughs> six, seven years. And, uh, and you want a state to be created in two years? So, and uh, <clears throat> the Security Council did impose that deadline. Well, obviously, by the time the first United Nations withdraw from Team 2003, we were extremely fragile situation. You know how much was our budget then in Timor-Leste in 2003? $68 million to deal with everything. Of course, there were generous donor assistance that was separate from the budget. I would have uh, to go to Brussels, to Sweden, to Norway, to Washington, everywhere, begging for budget assistance. So uh, then 2006, we had our first major political security crisis over which I almost paid with my life. But in, I came to New York this uh, May 2006, embarrassed. The worst moment of uh, after independence, at least. Going to the Security Council May 5th, pleading to re-engage with Timor-Leste. Well, 
the UN as always very responsive, the international community, and there was a re-engagement in full force. But I promised the Security Council as well at the time. I insisted on a five year. I was told by more experienced people in the Secretariat to say, don't scare them away, don't talk about five years. They don't like to hear that. I'm sorry, I will talk about five years. They have to think five years. Well, we had five year mission, approved every year, and, but it was understood everywhere it's going to be five years. But I told Security Council, if, the, if at the end of the five years, I still will have to come to ask you to stay on, then you should simply issue a certificate of incompetence for all of us, Timorese leaders. Back in East Timor, I would talk with political leaders in the meetings that I chair. I would say, have you looked on a map? We are not exactly the center of the world, even if we might think we are. And I would list the many problems the UN deal with. 20, more or less, big problem. And we think they're going to stay on if by 2012 we are not on our feet. No, my point is leaders have to live up to their responsibility themselves. In Guinea-Bissau, Bissau Guinean authorities, politicians have to live up to their own responsibilities. ECOWAS, African Union, European Union, the UN, uh, have the right to demand on them responsibilities. As I told our people so many times, the international community has the right to demand from us accountability. They have taxpayers. They have committed. They have people who died here in Timor-Leste. So I hope that the Bissau Guineans, uh, after the shock of uh, you know, this, uh, the, recent, uh, the most recent coup and subsequent sanctions, suspension, have had an impact not only on the economic, social condition, but on the mindset, on the morale of people. They are really down, they are embarrassed. And uh, so I think we will overcome this uh, chapter. I hope that uh, with continuing strong leadership from ECOWAS, the African Union, all of us supporting uh, ECOWAS and African Union, uh, working with CPLP and the European Union, by February next year, we can have uh, the Secretary General presiding over a pledging conference uh, to uh, uh, inspire the international community to re-engage with Guinea-Bissau, to build the institution of the state. But even before that, I hope that, for instance, first, we will talk with the government in Bissau. I hope that the IMF, uh, IMF is not my favorite institution, but um, uh, same time they did a great job in Timor-Leste. Our Minister of Finance is highly disciplined, partly thanks to the IMF draconian uh, 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 teachings. Uh, we adapted and so on, but to make it a bit more palatable, uh, IMF should right now allocate experts into the Ministry of Finance, into the banking system. Because, uh, you know, the military, they go to uh, the Ministry of Finance and uh, take money. You know, I've never seen uh, any uh, state that functions like that. So there has to be a beginning now, because that, there is no need of UN resources, extra resources. UN uh, IMF experts, World Bank, ADB experts can be start to be allocated now in the transition institutions. So that by the time we have the election, the country has already made some visible progress. The authorities have also to show greater uh, will in uh, fighting the drug cartel. Uh, you know about Admiral Bubu Nachutu, who was, uh, he's now in Manhattan. Ironically, I was told that uh, he was always a great, uh, a great admirer of the United States. He, uh, I'd never been to his house, but they said he had everything American in the house. He always wanted to come to uh, Manhattan. 
Yeah, that's what people tell me, you know. Well, uh, uh, he's here. And uh, it sent a convincing signal to people that crime doesn't pay. It really shook everybody. I'm not uh, saying this to endorse or recommend uh, that this kind of actions of uh, uh, DAA did should be the norm, but it happened. And uh, it really shook everybody. And I believe uh, they realize that uh, some eyes are watching. And uh, so I end here and be happy to answer questions. <laughs> Thank you. I want to keep going with some of these subjects. By the way, the story of how they captured him is a wonderful story uh, because he believed too much in the American he was talking to, who turned out to be an undercover agent, went on a boat ride, and the boat ride went out to where they could arrest him and bring him to Manhattan. And he is with us now. Um, uh, Jose, I want to ask you a couple of questions about uh, Guinea-Bissau. One of them is the army. Obviously, one of the things you have to do, I don't know if you have to do, but Guinea-Bissau has to do, is to build a professional army, an army that will function uh, as an army that will work to interdict uh, drug traffic and in particular will not seize power every time they have a chance to. Is there a good chance? Are there people in the military who you can look at and depend upon to say, uh, help us build a professional army? Yes, uh, there are uh, some, uh, let me say, you know, there are some outstanding, many outstanding people in Guinea-Bissau or from Guinea-Bissau abroad. Some of the most highly educated economists, lawyers, medical doctors from Guinea-Bissau. Some of the most senior people working in the World Bank, uh, African uh, UN Commission, Economic Commission for Africa, like the head is... Um, Carlos Lopez, highly respected regard all over Africa. So there are many people all over. In the military also, we have younger officers who are trained in the top colleges in Europe. But these younger officers with high, high education, master's degrees in law, besides being an officer, military, well, they, uh, many of them, they left because they uh, were disenchanted with the traditional older leadership. Maybe the traditional older leadership uh, felt a bit, you know, uh, maybe uh, uh, intimid uh, intimidated by this. So there are. But even the older leadership, I have met with them, uh, all of them, they accept the concept, the need of complete reform of the armed forces. The, the, uh, sometimes the choice of words are, are important. In the very first meeting I had with them, I said, A, let's not call it reform. Because in some languages you translate the word, it means go home. When we actually mean is the modernization of the armed forces. Modernize armed forces, A to Z. Uh, make it more slim, less costly, but same time more effective, more operational. And they accept that. The lead agency to deal with the uh, Guinea-Bissau modern armed forces is ECOWAS, particularly in Nigeria. I have a talk on numerous occasions with Nigerian officials, in particular with President Gulak Jonathan. We develop a great working relationship and I told the president, but also I had the audacity of telling all the ECOWAS leaders in a summit in Yamasukra, telling them, if you and us, the UN, cannot resolve the problem of Guinea-Bissau, are you going to be able to resolve the problem of Mali? Are you going to be able to resolve the problem of Congo? Well, they accepted the challenge because sometimes even, you know, uh, in ECOWAS, you know, and it's natural. You know, when you want to deal, when in the past I was uh, engaged in some lobbying in helping Burma, I would tell friends in Washington, if it doesn't go up to the president himself, the people in Burma, they know that the extent of U.S. engagement, the extent of European engagement is only in the annual pronouncements in the General Assembly. But when the president of the United States pick up the phone, to call someone, 
and regularly, well, then you know it's very high up on the Washington agenda. And uh, otherwise, they know it's formality. You know, that you hear a speech and then they will make a speech again the following year. And uh, so in West Africa, I, tell Brad, I told Brad, good luck, Jonathan. Please, you have to engage, stay personally engaged. Then they, uh, so, uh, and the president uh, and all of them, very, uh, in spite of their challenges. So they are the ones, but at the same time, bringing in partners. It would be hypocritical, too convenient, for everybody to applaud ECOWAS and say, yes, you do it, we recognize, and, and we cannot help you. No, uh, there has to be resources to support ECOWAS because they are the ones shouldering the entire burden. So Brazil can come in. And uh, I was very pleased to hear from President Makisal of Senegal, you know, uh, after the tensions between uh, ECOWAS and CPLP, President Macky Sall of Senegal talked about to, uh, uh, bringing in CPLP countries to help with the security sector reform. So uh, uh, things are in place. So, but not too many countries involved, because otherwise, you know, uh, people on the ground get confused. In Timor-Leste, sometimes over the years, we had so many police training, some tell you to salute with the left hand, others tell you to salute with the right hand, and <laughs> you get, that's a bit exaggerating, but <laughs> so as long as many can, but same doctrine, same, uh, and that's where the UN, uh, the security sector of reform of the United Nations can help in providing leadership and coherence. I always tell in Guinea Bissau partners, there are two things the United Nations doesn't do. One, it doesn't build churches. Second, it doesn't build armies. What it can provide is vision, it can provide leadership, and uh, help, you know, uh, choosing partners for you, uh, reviewing, and so on. So the UN has to stay engaged actively in coordinating all these donors. Uh, and, uh, but that, the Secretary General, Security Council, yesterday, were, we are all, my, myself, my staff, uh, DPA, we are all very pleased with the Security Council reaction and the European Union reaction. The Peace Building Fund, the Peace Building Commission, have done excellent work and is one of the best uh, mechanisms uh, that the United Nations thought of, that created, particularly the fast track, the, you know, that in three weeks, uh, things can be done. So we are reviewing the situation in Guinea-Bissau, reviewing the priorities, and then present, uh, how you say, an update on the situation to Peace Building Fund to see how quickly Peace Building Fund can re-engage. Because of the sanctions, Peace Building Fund also retreated. But uh, our Assistant Secretary General Hopkins and the uh, members, the Brazilian chair chairperson, uh, very committed to uh, re-engage. But we will see what areas uh, Peace Building Fund could do more eff eff effectively and better use of uh, the money. Uh, Jose, I, I wanted to ask you about the UN in Guinea-Bissau, and PCB was part of it. Two other parts I wanted to ask you about. Um, in preparing for this, I think I ran across the fact that UNODC has disengaged or suspended operations. Can you explain yeah. uh, what that is, why, and whether they are needed and whether they will come back? And the second thing I want to ask you is, the UN is pretty good at um, helping people uh, hold elections. As I remember, in your own country, the UN Electoral Assistance Unit was very helpful. Is the UN involved in preparing for these elections at the end of the year? Uh, yes, uh, the Security Council resolution, I believe, will make a reference to that. But actually, today, I hand over to the Secretary General a uh, scanned copy of the letter sent by the interim president of Guinea-Bissau requesting uh, Guinea uh, United Nations assistance, leadership in that. And uh, that has been my strong recommendation, that better let the UN lead in the process. The UN has done fantastic work in this regard in extremely difficult circumstances. In Timor-Leste in 99, 
in Afghanistan, in Iraq. So total, very professional and credible. And the Bissau Guineans accept that. So, uh, but with African Union, ECOWAS that also have a great expertise. Uh, on the UNODC, uh, you know, sometimes I, you know, even though I'm already uh, have enough age and enough, uh, live long enough to uh, know everything, but sometimes I think I'm uh, totally naive or innocent. And uh, I told the Security Council yesterday in the closed door session, and uh, I couldn't understand that the international community, particularly the powers that be, make such a huge issue of Guinea-Bissau as a narco state, and yet not able to find a few hundred thousand dollars to keep a significant, robust UNODC presence there. The last lonely person left already because there is no money, just one person. And I, I, uh, uh, and I say lonely because I was a, a, a poor a Portuguese uh, gentleman and uh, he was really lonely, alone <laughs> in Guinea-Bissau. And he left, no money. Well, is the situation serious or not serious? You know, and uh, so, uh, but uh, I presume the powers that be are now uh, embarrassed enough and they are going to find the money to redeploy UNODC there, but uh, uh, not with just one other lonely person there. <laughs> uh, at least four internationals with uh, national staff uh, deployed in four regions of the country uh, to monitor, to do training, uh, etc. Uh, I believe it will happen, but also the Peace Building Fund is looking at creative ways how to be able to uh, support. It cannot provide salaries to, uh, you know, because they say, you know, the fund cannot support another UN agency, and they're absolutely correct. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, if the issue of the drug has to do with justice, with stability, with peace, then ways can be found. So they are looking into, uh, into that. Two more things I want to ask you. Um, your comment about the success that um, Bissau and Guineans have abroad uh, reminds me of conversations we've had in this room in recent years about Somalia. Somalia is a country that was in deep trouble and maybe still be in deep trouble, but it was always commented that Somalians, once they went elsewhere in Africa, were always very successful. Uh, is the same thing true of the Bissau and Guineans? And can you make them come back? That's the real question. How can you persuade them to come back to their own country? Yeah, that is a very difficult uh, challenge. How can you convince a Bissau Guinean who is making $10,000 or 5,000 euros 10, 000, as a medical doctor in Portugal or in Belgium to come to Guinea-Bissau and make 50 euros? Only Mother Teresa will do that. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, uh, so it's very difficult. And then if, as some people, well, you find resources and pay them well to bring them back, well, then you create a problem. And those who never left, I have met many Bissau Guinean doctors who have been there all their lives, never left, and making $50, $100. So as, that's very, uh, very difficult uh, uh, situation. I don't know how uh, could end. But on the other hand, in the case of Timor-Leste, we don't have that many highly educated people abroad, like Bissau, Guinea-Bissau. But I always said, I really don't care whether our people stay abroad. As long as they are Timorese and they progress in the United States, in Australia, wherever, become doctors, become scientists, and uh, uh, help their country of origin, because this is a global world. You know, uh, look at the uh, United States, some of the most, how you say, uh, successful, su successful countries in terms of uh, influencing U.S. foreign policy are those that have a strong communities in the United States, you know, of uh, the original country, and are organized 
So they become powerful. In Australia, we, uh, of course, the Australians, by nature, are very sympathetic to the underdog. You talk to an Australian, when we managed, when we had a fight with the Australian government over the maritime uh, boundary issue, the foreign minister at the time was angry with me because I would go around to the communities in Australia and get all the Australians on the side of the Timorese. <laughs> and the government was, and we managed to get the best possible deal from uh, the beginning when Australia wanted to give us only 10% and Australia 90%, which is totally understandable. Australia is bigger, so has bigger necessities. Timor is smaller, so lesser. That's at least understanding in Australia. But we turned things around, we got 90% and Australia 10% by going to the Australian public. And uh, uh, so uh, we, uh, wherever people are from Guinea-Bissau, uh, it's no point trying to lure them back with satellites because you create additional problems. You have to create conditions for those who are there now so that they don't leave. In my country, we have now, by two, three years from now, the highest per capita of medical doctors per population. I only said, I was very harsh with the prime minister and the government. How can we pay politicians, you know, $4,000, $5,000, who really do very little, and then you pay a medical doctor $300? We paid a, a politician in team of about $4,000 a month. Well, the government listened, and then the, so the salary went up to minimum $2,000, $1,500 for a young medical doctor. And so you do create conditions to keep the best people in the country. No point trying to lure them back through special rent because create additional uh, new problems. But there is a group of uh, Bissau Guinean doctors in Portugal who they are now organizing, coming to do visit to Guinea-Bissau and do volunteer work. That's great. I saw them recently in uh, Guinea-Bissau. The last thing I want to ask you is just about, about the, uh, the population there. Uh, what kinds of attitudes and hopes do they have after so much disappointment, uh, repression, uh, a, uh, a military that intervenes every time there is a chance to do so? Uh, uh, and I guess I'm talking about civil society, but I'm really even talking about even people who are not organized in civil society organizations. Is the population of Guinea-Bissau ready to follow somebody or some institutions that will give them some hope of stabilizing their future? You know, uh, one thing that I failed to share with you, uh, I have been to over 100 countries. And I love uh, my people, my country. But I have to say, the people of Guinea-Bissau give the political leaders less headache than uh, people in Timor-Leste, particularly the young people. Our young people are so restless, demanding, impatient. Uh, I personally, as president, for a minute, I spent countless, countless hours you know, calming down the youth. Guinea-Bissau, they don't cause any problem. One day I was driving through uh, some backyard in Bissau with just one person, uh, a United Nations uh, official, Antero Lopez, and with a UN car. And I told him, Antero, if that was in Bekora, Bekora is in a suburb in Timur, we would have already th stones thrown at us. Bissau was totally peaceful. In uh, Timor, in the beginning, there were a lot of uh, damage to UN cars. And uh, we couldn't figure out why. Well, before the UN set up its own mechanic workshop, it had to go to the private workshop. So the owners of the workshop would encourage the youth to damage UN cars so that they have a business. And they actually would give money to the, to the youth. You know, you get five dollars here, ten dollars, depend on which car you. Uh, <laughs> very naughty. Uh, uh. That's entrepreneurship. <laughs> um, I'd love to get some questions and comments, uh, and I'll take a couple at once if I see some more hands. Jeffrey Laurenti, of course, here. Um, 
the second, you'll be the second, Mike Michele, and, and third here. Okay, we'll do three questions and then you can answer all three at end. Jeffrey Laurenti. Uh, Jeff Laurenti with the Century Foundation. Uh, Mr. Ramos Horta, uh, I think we might all hope that this assignment, this going through purgatory, will take you eventually to that diplomatic paradise of a Vatican ambassadorship <laughs> afterwards. Uh, I have two questions to ask. The first one flows from the one that Warren had just posed to you. What do you see as the social forces within Guinea-Bissau society that are already mobilizing, uh, trying to, to reshape or redirect the, uh, the country's future? Is it whatever there may be of labor unions, teachers? Uh, what are the, the, the kind of building blocks of democratic mobilization? And what are the kinds of issues that, as best as you can tell, average Guinea-Bissauans say, that's important and that's what I want to see politicians do? The second question, since you've emphasized a certain similarity between Timor-Leste and uh, Guinea-Bissau, is based on your own experience of it, what can you tell your uh, national authorities in Timor-Leste are the things that being an agenda country of the Peace Building Commission can deliver for it if it should uh, wish to be inscribed? Because it's kind of been uh, trying to waltz away from that status. Do you see the PBC as delivering something in Guinea-Bissau uh, that maybe Timor-Lestians would want to have too? The second one is here. Uh, Michele? And if you would introduce yourself, please. Yes, uh, of course. I'm Michele Tomasi from uh, the Mission of Italy. Italy is also part of the country configuration Guinea-Bissau, so it's a country that we follow closely. Uh, thank you very much, Warren, for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramos Sorta, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. In fact, it's extremely important to have news from the field, and sometimes here at the Secretariat, even if we call ourselves peace building or peacekeeping experts, sometimes we're really far from the field. So you gave us some interesting uh, uh, information regarding the dynamics in the country. I would like to come back to the problem of uh, drug trafficking. This is one of the things we Everybody is talking about drug trafficking in Guinea-Bissau because there are direct uh, consequences on, on the countries. Uh, both of you mentioned, uh, Warren and, and uh, Ms. ramos and also yesterday, you mentioned this American operation against the Admiral, I mean, this new, uh, more uh, aggressive policy of the American authorities to stop this phenomenon. And I think that it's an important thing. But you also say that uh, it was a strong signal given to Guinea-Bissau, the proof of the fact that the international community is not going to accept anymore Guinea-Bissau to become a platform for drug trafficking. We all hope so. But I'd like to know if you're, if, is it really like this? Did you, did you have the feeling uh, in the country that the army could be, or those responsible in the army could be a little bit more uh, worrying about that, that that could help decreasing the phenomenon. Thank you very much. Very good. And the gentleman here on the, we'll get to you in a second. A, we'll take these three and then uh, answer, get some more. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, my name is uh, Emmanuel Pakandiande. I work with the Office of Military Affairs, DPKO. Uh, first, I have a two pronged question as well. First is, what do you consider the regional implication of the crisis in Guinea-Bissau, with especially the situation in, of course, regarding drug trafficking in Mali, because we are told that uh, Guinea-Bissau was the entry point for which drugs went through Mali and upwards to the north. And uh, second, uh, will you please tell us what the ethnic relations in Guinea-Bissau, uh, how they relate to the, the current crisis and how they will impact going forward. Thank you, sir. Okay. Want to take those three? Um, one uh, critical uh, issue in Guinea Bissau, in Timor Leste, or anywhere is leadership. Leadership can bring peace, leadership can cause havoc, like it happened in the Balkans or in Rwanda. People on their own, rarely they kill each other. Often people in communities have tensions, sometimes uh, land dispute, boundary dispute, sometimes water dispute. 
but uh, the scale of violence that happened in many countries, like in uh, the former Yugoslavia, was when Milosevic came into radio, television, and instigated, you know, the violence. Rwanda the same. And uh, when uh, I give an example, eh, uh, also. One country that I admire enormously is the Republic of Korea, South Korea. I was one who one day in a hotel room in Seoul, working with a young Korean scholar called Han Jum Kim. He was an aide to President Kim Dae-jun. I nominated President Kim Dae-jun for the Nobel Peace Prize. He won and he insisted I should attend and I went. And why? Well. I, uh, during the 2006 to uh, 2007 financial economic crisis in Southeast Asia, one thing that was so is overwhelming when you saw the very proud, hardworking people of Korea, by the hundreds of thousands, going to the banks, hand over their uh, gold rings, gold watches, bracelets, everything, wedding rings, earrings, to the banks to pay the debt. And they did, within months, they paid the debt to. I mentioned this story once in a dinner with Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And he said, yes, that's true. I also hand over my wedding ring. And, uh, and that, of course, happened because the Korean people are very special, very proud. But uh, the moral authority of Kim Dae-jun, when he was first elected, so uh, leaders can inspire people toward sacrifices when they believe. In my country, when Shandana Guzman, guerrilla fighter, 17 years, then prisoner, seven years, he was the one who, with us, articulated reconciliation with Indonesia. Well, uh, there were some NGOs that were upset here and there, challenged, but uh, overwhelming majority of people went. And we never had a single uh, violence act against any Indonesian citizen living in my country. We have thousands there. Not a single incident happened, uh, unlike in Kosovo and uh, Serbia, no? for instance. So leadership. Guinea-Bissau has a bit of lacking of that. However, PIGC resolving the leadership issue, not through young leaders, but through the older generation that are genuine from the veteran fighting, you know, of the 60s. They have to take over again because they have credibility. Uh, so that probably will, uh, uh, peace building, uh, there are uh, areas of priority that uh, everybody agreed, you know. As long as we don't reform the security sector, we will have uh, problems. Is it possible? Yes. I don't think there is any resistance today to the modernization reform of the security sector. But it's a patient work. It will take minimum three years to five when we can declare the security sector of Guinea-Bissau thoroughly reorganized. And that is possible. And that's where PBC has been focused and can continue to focus. Justice sector has to also be reformed, modernized, and working with civil society, supporting. I give you an example. You know, a few weeks ago, I decided to invite all the local journalists for dinner with me. First, so that everybody knows the SISG is paying attention to the local media. Uh, B, to look at how we can uh, help them. And. Uh, there is not a single daily newspaper in uh, Guinea-Bissau. And most of the newspapers don't reach wider audience. With wider audience is the community radios. So PBC, but I also mentioned the European Union, USAID, can, should support more. The media, civil society organizations, there are many that are very good, because they are the, will be the roots of democracy in uh, Guinea-Bissau. It doesn't mean that it's black and white. When you talk groups of uh, civil society, they are aligned with different political parties. So it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, civil society is an abstract body. If you take, don't take the ratio, the individuals, we're dealing with human beings. 
And in a country like Guinea Bissau, like in my country, difficult to find someone who is, doesn't have a political affiliation. And when I meet with 100 people, by the base of their questions, I know, okay, this one is sympathetic to PAGC, that one cannot stand PAGC, and this is a civil society. So, um, quick impact projects, that is vital. I give an example of a DAS NGO I met recently in Bissau uh, over a dinner with uh, some uh, expatriates who live there for 30 years. Well, this uh, gentleman from uh, Holland, no previous relationship with Guinea Bissau. I don't remember his story, how he ended up there. Uh, he has funding, little money from friends in Holland. He built uh, uh, tanks, cement tank to capture rainwater. Each of them cost only 200 euros. Because during the rainy season, no drinking water, because all get very you know, polluted. So uh, he's building that. So this kind of activities and many others. But the long term you know, rebuilding of the state institutions, well, that's uh, the UN mission work in partnership with the agencies. The agencies are coordinated by UNDP. And, uh, you know, one thing that I, I, I been in Guinea-Bissau, uh, as part of the UN, I begin to believe in that, uh, uh, what the UN often talk about, integrated mission, integrated approach, and it does work. You know, it's not always easy to coordinate. Uh, there are sometimes, uh, you know, some uh, of the agencies get more support than others have difficulties like World Food Program. Recently was complaining about lack of uh, financing for World Food Program. And uh, while UNICEF, you know, uh, a bit more sophisticated in their marketing and uh, in their presentation, they, uh, so very difficult. Uh, you know, many years ago I was, when Serge de Mello left Timor-Leste, he was upset with me because I had told Kofi Annan Initially, he was going to timor -Leste for six months. Then there was possibility of job for him with uh, ACNUR, UNHCR. Soon after, I came to New York. I talked to Richard Holbrook and to Kofi Annan. I said, no, don't take him away from Tim. So he lost that chance. <laughs> and he said, when I went back, he said, Jose, thanks a lot. And, uh, but then they, were, they offered him the job as a World Food Program Director. He said, Jose, I'm not going to go around the world. I don't it find very exciting to ask for food. So there are some, uh, some agencies that are not very much like, you know, uh, in the media, like ACNUR because of the drama. So they have difficulties raising uh, money. But uh, that's when uh, in the integrated approach, I told, European Union, the Americans. If you are imposing sanctions on Guinea-Bissau, I understand because of your laws, but then don't take the money back to Washington or to Brussels. Reallocate the money to the UN agencies, to UNDP, to UNICEF, to World Food Program. It's very convenient, you know, you save $10 million from the sanctions and take it back to Brussels. How about uh, reallocating to the partner agencies of the UN? that are there and with the struggle with enormous difficulties. On the drug trafficking, uh, uh, I believe Guinea-Bissau is one of the easiest situations in uh, eradicating uh, drug trafficking there. Hey, I have to say again in all frankness, the Europeans talk a lot about drug trafficking because it does affect obviously Europe and it does affect United States, although the drugs from Guinea-Bissau doesn't come to United States. Uh, however, there has not very little resources allocated to the authorities in Guinea-Bissau. Then they come with the excuse, well, we don't recognize the government. But you, you can find other ways to support because not everybody, you know, like the drug agency in Guinea-Bissau, they did do the coup. So when are you going to re-engage them, next year? So why not now? We have to be pragmatic with that. And, uh, but I believe it's possible uh, to eradicate completely, you know, in Guinea-Bissau as a transit uh, point. 
but we talk less about to uh, we talk less about to uh, illegal uh, fishing well uh, there is a lot of illegal fishing throughout west africa tens of millions of dollars are robbed from west african nations by whom by those fishing boats from countries that don't like to talk about it uh, so you talk only about uh, the drug uh, problem. So uh, I don't uh, elaborate more on that because otherwise they upset. They will tell the Secretary General um, that I was talking about something I shouldn't be talking about. That is illegal fishing. And uh, <laughs> so uh, a second, uh, you, you asked about his ethnicity problem. Guinea-Bissau, of course, like most of Africa, like Timor-Leste, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, rich diversity of ethnicity, of culture, of religion. And that's what makes life, uh, country, societies most fascinating, most interesting. But one thing that amazed me about Guinea-Bissau is, I would say, you know, I wish some, a sociologist would write something about Guinea-Bissau, explaining why in that multi-ethnic country, multi-religion, multi-culture, multilinguist, there has never been ethnic-based violence. And uh, never, ever in the history of Guinea-Bissau, you had Balantas in the streets fighting each other. Uh, as it happened in my own country, as it happened in Kenya following the elections, in Cote d'Ivoire, etc. Not in Guinea-Bissau. And that is very ethnically uh, distinct groups. And yet they are totally uh, living in harmony. Even when they are disenchanted with the political elites, with the state, they don't go out and rob warehouses of the state. They don't go out and burn cars. Very unique people. And for that, they deserve all the support. And the problem in the army has nothing to do with ethnicity. Uh, many experts have put this on the wrong issue. Uh, like, in any country with different et ethnic groups, some ethnic groups are very good in uh, fighting. They love the army. Others, you ask them whether they want to join the army, they don't want, they want trade. Some, they want to be civil servants. But we have uh, this Western notion, modern concept that you know the army has to be very balanced, all the ethnic groups represented in the army. No, you have to be, <laughs> there are some particular group, there's particular kind where there is an imbalance, but naturally imbalance. The question is when the leadership of the country, the politics and the army know how to manage this imbalance. The right people, the right ethnic group in the right place. You know, you, you send as Kumbayala did when he took over as a president because he was Balanta, he put so many balance in public administration as disaster. They don't like it. The worst period of Guinea-Bissau in terms of mismanagement of public administration when he brought so many balantas into the public administration. But they were great fighters, the balantas. When they are anchored in a proper framework, in a modern army, discipline, yeah, they defend their country, and when the African Union needs them to go to Mali here and there to fight, yeah, they would be a great fighting force. Sorry. Uh, fine, fine. We've got a couple more minutes. Do, do you not want to ask a question? You, okay. You, and then maybe one last one, if, or yours will be the last question. You uh, raised the issue of... Please identify the, yourself. Oh, Jonathan Granoff, President of Global Security Institute. Um, you raised the issue of the importance of leadership. And when one looks at your life, sir, you see that you were a leader in taking a country into being. After you got shot, you continued to take it to a global level and become a global moral leader. The crisis of moral inspiring leadership is a global crisis. I wondered if you could talk about how we can enhance the number of global moral leaders, not just in Africa, but here in the United Nations and in my country. Uh, 
That is a very, very difficult question uh, to, uh, to answer. In history, you know, it's been always like that for hundreds of years, in some countries, in other countries. Time to time, you have a great leaders. Then there are periods when those great leaders disappear and the country was brought, the empire collapsed, the, the country was brought to destruction. Uh, you know, it's difficult to, uh, and you don't get leaders out of universities. You can have a, a great PhD or two or three PhDs, but you are not necessarily a great political leader. And uh, in many of the conflict situations in the world uh, happen because of uh, leadership. Sometimes leaders are too proud. Uh, you know, in my own country, I remember in January 2003, immediately after independence, I was foreign minister. And uh, we had a retreat in January 2003. And I said, leaders go up and down. Governments today can be even very credible in terms of doing great um, government, uh, prof competent, but often it loses touch with the people, connection, uh, because of arrogance. And I said, our government, and that was a majority government, increasingly is being perceived as arrogant. And I said, when we are at the peak of the power, let's descend to the valley and embrace those on the fringes of power. Let's be humble. When you're in power, you can afford to be humble. But some people, when they're in power, even more arrogant. And then I said at the time, uh, half sarcastic. Even if we cannot, you cannot be genuinely humble, at least pretend to be humble. <laughs> and uh, for me, the great quality of a leader is humility. And I have to say, in you know, one day, uh, I, w I was in South Africa. Mandela had been just released. And uh, somehow I decided he has to see me. So I went to South Africa, stayed with an ANC a friend. His name is Robert, uh, half Irish, Robert McBride. He was the last person sent into death by the apartheid regime because he was involved in the blowing up of the South African Air Force Club. Well, when Mandela came out, the first person he put pressure to be released, spare life, was Robert McBride. So I stayed with Robert in his, uh, and I told everybody, I'm not leaving until I see the president. And that was an unknown entity. That was before the Nobel Peace Prize. Somehow it got to President Mandela. He was in hospital. He left hospital. He was on, had on a knee operation, went to his house. I was two hours away from uh, Johannesburg at McBride's uh, uh, house. We got a message, the president wants to see you. So you rush to Johannesburg and went to his house and they took me to his bedroom because he was um, still laid down because of the knee operation. And he said, I heard you said you wouldn't leave South Africa until you saw me. I said, that's true. Well, because I presume we have a lot of things to do for your country, I decide not to waste your time and uh, see you. And uh, that was, you know, obviously long before Timor Leste's independence. I was, I was a totally unknown uh, entity, except among the comrades of ANC who knew me, but not to Mandela. What uh, for me, uh, and I was totally excited. Of, uh, and then I asked him, I asked him to uh, uh, talk to President Suharto of Indonesia to secure the release of my own leader, Shanana Guzman. And Mandela went to Indonesia, and only Mandela could convince Suharto to get Shannon out of prison for a dinner with Mandela. I arrived, so Mandela returned, I got a phone call saying the President Mandela wants to talk to me. I was, I happened to be in Lisbon. And I rushed to a place so that I could get the call. The phone rang and it was Mandela himself. 
And he said, uh, I want to see you. I said, uh, Your Excellency, Comrade President, whenever you want. How about tomorrow? I said, President, I have to check flights. I don't know whether I can get. We already booked for you. <laughs> so I had to leave that night to go to see him. Well, a giant of a man, you know, he didn't mind talking to a little person unknown like me. You know, uh, so that's, you know, it taught me a lot, you know, about to, uh, humility. And, uh, but that happened accidentally through history. You don't make, you know, you don't create leaders. Uh, anyway, so I'm sorry I couldn't answer, give a better, a more intelligent answer to your question. Uh, that's a highly intelligent answer, and it gives me a way to thank you, because um, aside from all the obvious reasons, Jose Ramos Horta is my kind of guy, because you ask him a question and he tells you a story. Uh, and if you've been aware of it, I think every single question has been asked, and even when he's not asked a question, he'll tell you a story. I have a particular passion for that way of communicating. But today, he didn't tell the full story. I was trying. I was trying to make myself seen by Sonia Braga, <laughs> and he kept on talking and talking with her. And I thought, Mr. God, he's not even good looking like Bill Clinton. Why? <laughs> why, Sonia Braga just talked to him and completely ignored me. I was irritated. <laughs> Anyway, I want to thank Jose Ramos Horta for telling the stories today, and thank you all.